it's time for some real education. Gerard Manley Hopkins was an English poet and Jesuit priest whose fame established him among the leading Victorian poets. His manipulation of prosody, particularly his concept of sprung rhythm, established him as an innovative writer of verse, as did his technique of praising God through vivid use of imagery and nature. By 1930, his work was recognized as one of the most original literary accomplishments of his century. Uh, Hopkins is one of those guys like Dostoevsky in the Russian tradition who's writing after something really important happened and reviving it. In the case of Dostoevsky, as the Russian people began to lurch towards socialism and then communism, at the, almost the very same time that, that Hopkins was doing what he was doing, Dostoevsky was writing his great novels that were calling out godless materialism. Here, after the Enlightenment, after the Romantic period in English poetry, when God was largely being displaced through a new paganism, right, where God was no longer necessarily transcendent, the Romantic poets were identifying God in trees, in nature. Uh, and so here you have Hopkins, who's come after both of those movements, and yet he is reclaiming two things in British poetry. One, he is talking about a transcendent God, and two, he is going back to the idea that God can be part of nature, but that nature can point to the biggerness of God, the bigness of God, the transcendent nature of God. Take one of my favorite poems from Ham Hopkins. It's called God's Grandeur. How big, how grand, how uncontainable is God. And it begins like this. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It's not containing it. It doesn't limit God's power to the world. But this world of ours that he gave us, this world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out, that grandeur, like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed why do men then now not wreck his rod? Why in this time of radical industrialization, why do men, despite the presence of God everywhere, why do they not listen to him? Why do men then now not wreck his rod, pay attention to his power? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man smudge, and shares man smell, the way that man's grimy fingerprint is negatively all over the world we inhabit. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, Nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights of the black west went, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with, ah, bright wings that there's no depredation that human beings could wreak on the world that God made would ultimately take away the grandeur of that God who made the universe.